Is the government facing a fiscal, a financial crisis right now? Is the IMF going to have to be called in to rescue the UK? The UK is £2.9 trillion pounds in debt. The UK economy is not in a strong position. We've got huge debt, budget deficit and interest costs that are spiralling out of control. Britain's economy is under incredible strain. More than you may realise. OK, that's very scary, isn't it? Their projections are based on banks are just intermediaries who, rather than lending money themselves, what they do is they take in deposits from savers and they lend them out. And if you look at it properly and see what banks actually do, all those scare stories disappear. Going off into the 2070s, you are talking about a national debt that is higher than we have ever seen outside of war, 274%. And you'd be wrong because the government will not go bankrupt. The, the debt levels will not reach those ceilings. Absolutely false logic. So Ed Conway has done one of his usual empirical investigations. What he's looking at here is the borrowing cost for the UK and whether this is going to drive the United Kingdom government bankrupt. I have a lot of time for Ed's work, but this one, he's got to do a bit more research. Let's have a listen anyway to what he argues here. If the pound starts falling and what happens to the pound just now, look at this. It went down really sharply against the US dollar. Raising the question, what is behind it? Well, part of it is about inflation. This is UK versus everyone else when it comes to inflation. If you're looking at that and you're thinking, well, it looks like inflation's a bit kind of, you know, stuck in in the UK, maybe you're going to charge a higher interest rate. Uh, for the UK. So inflation is potentially part of it, but as is what's going on with the public finances. And when it's what's going on with public finances is well, this chart tells you a pretty stark story, okay? Th this is showing you the projections for how much tax revenue is going to come in in the UK in the coming years and what's going to happen to spending, okay? This is what's projected in the future. Things that are driving higher debt. It's health spending, it's pensioner spending. It's actually some of the things that the Chancellor says she wants to try and bear down on, but we know that she's struggled. So you've had all those U-turns about things like winter fuel. They've struggled to cut back on the difficult stuff, raising the question, what happens to that red line and what does it do as well for the total national debt? Because if you take those two lines I showed you a moment ago, take one away from the other, work out what it means for the total national debt, the total amount that the UK owes, this is what happens. Going off into the 2070s, you are talking about a national debt that is higher than we have ever seen outside of war, 274% of GDP. If it turns out that we are growing less fast than expected, and so you've got less money being generated and less tax revenue going into the exchequer, look at what happened. Instead, with weaker productivity, you were talking about the national debt going into crazy, into stratospheric territory, 640%. 47% uh, of GDP. Okay, that's very scary, isn't it? You'd be terrified that that's going to have a debt level of 650% of GDP. And you'd be wrong because, as you saw there, he's using Office of Budget Responsibility, I think the OBR stands for. I'm no great fan of acronyms. Anyway, back to the OBR. Their projections are based on a model of economics which says that Banks are just intermediaries who, rather than lending money themselves, what they do is they take in deposits from savers and they lend them out. And then when the government gets in there and borrows as well, that reduces the amount of money for firms, that reduces productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore you have to cut the government spending back to get the boost in productivity that it was talking about there that would allegedly reduce the level of debt level from 700% of GDP to 60% of GDP, if only we can grow faster. So the government's got to get get out of the way, cut its spending. Yes, there's going to be a few pensioners who freeze to death over winter, but you know, this is a sacrifice we, we real, really have to make, this sort of stuff. Now, that's pretty much stock standard. Ed is giving us a, a more colourful and entertaining view of what's being argued, of course, by the Office of Budget Responsibility and mainstream commentators like in the Financial Times, The Economist and so on, all terrified about the level of debt that the world is going to take on. Because we take a look at economic theory on how money is manufactured. Uh, you get this argument. This is in the Mancu textbook, but you can find it in any mainstream economic textbook. And what it tells you is that the way that debt is manufactured, the way that uh, banks create debt, is that the banks don't do it themselves. They take in money from savers and they lend that money out to borrowers. So fundamentally, the people doing the lending in the textbook model of what banks do, and this is the manufacturing of debt, is that the saver is the person who owns the debt. The banks are simply intermediaries who enable a household to lend to a firm. And then the terrifying 
prospect that Ed is talking about there comes from if the government borrows that much, there's less money available for firms to borrow. That'll reduce productivity growth. That'll lead to the blowout and level of private debt. So we have to cut back on government spending because that crowds out the private sector and that'll leave less money for the private sector to invest and therefore we'll end up in that terrifying future that the Office of Budget Responsibility tells we face. But that's not the only theory of how money is created and how debt is created. There's another one. And the Bank of England came out and said, what the textbooks teach you is frankly wrong. This is a paper from 2014. Now, this argument from the Bank of England says that model's wrong. That is not what banks do. Banks do not take in deposits and lend them out. Instead, the argument they make is say that whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. So it's the bank that does the lending, not the households. And when they do it, they actually create money. It isn't just debt they're creating, which is the conventional model. They're also creating money. Now, that's a huge difference. Is the manufacturing process of money what the textbooks teach? Or is the manufacturing process of money what the Bank of England says here? And what my side of economics has been saying for over a century, people like Schumpeter, like Fisher, like Basil Moore, like Hyman Minsky have all been saying that the banks originate money and debt. And my little acronym for that, which I want to make popular, so use it with your friends, is we don't live in a loanable funds model, and that's the textbook model. We live in a bank-originated money and debt model. Otherwise, we live in a bond economy. So pass that one around, please. So which one is the Office of Budget Responsibility using to get those projections? Well, I can show you in my Ravel software. And by the way, if you want to use my proprietary software Ravel for economic analysis too, you get it as a free bonus inside my seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge, like over 600 people have already done. To learn more, apply at stevekeen.com. So let's now take a look at a number of Ravel models here. I've got four, so don't let that intimidate too much. I'm going to go on and take a look at it. And this is the one that the textbooks teach. And this is what the terrifying level of debt coming out. I haven't got the government in here. I just want to cut the absolute bare bones that if this is the way in which banks operate, do they create money? And the answer is no. And what I've simply got is savers lending to borrowers, credit, credit dollars per year. So the amount of money being lent is can be positive or negative. If people are repaying debt, credit is negative, and therefore the debt level falls. If people are borrowing money, it's positive and the debt level rises. Now, if I run this model, at the moment I've got no borrowing going on, so everything is flat lines. If I now say, let's credit, say, 1% of GDP or 2% of GDP or 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, nothing happens to GDP. Okay? Absolutely nothing happens. So that's an extremely stylized version of the model that is taught by textbooks. And in this case, no change in GDP. What you could do if you're an economist and you believe this stuff, you could build macroeconomic models did not include banks or debt or money at all. And guess what? That's the sort of models the mainstream builds. They build models in which neither debt nor banks nor money actually exist because according to this theory of how banks operate, that doesn't matter. The macroeconomy is unaffected by it. Now, they've made that extremely stylized because I want to compare it to another model, which is one where I have the banks actually originating money and debt. This is the bond model. And all that happens between the two models, just to contrast them one against the other, in the model that the textbooks teach, and this is what the Office of Budget Responsibility is still using the model, despite the Bank of England saying this is false over a decade ago. Banks are intermediaries. Banks do not lend. They just simply enable, enable savers to lend to borrowers, which means that the debt which exists in this model is actually an asset of the savers. It's not an asset of the banks. What it also means technically is that everything happens on the liability side of the bank's uh, ledger. There's nothing happening on the asset side because it's a transfer of money from savers and the savings bank account is a liability of the banking sector to the borrowers. And that's another liability of the banking sector. So everything happens on the liability side, nothing happens on the asset side. And this is the theory of production for money. Now, when you look at the model that I am part of and the Bank of England came out and said is correct, where the one that the conventional textbook teaches is wrong, what you have is the debt is actually an asset of the banking sector. Uh, the savers, yeah, okay, people save money, but they're not being, their money is not being lent out at all. The money that we have in bank accounts is called demand deposits. Now, if you're somebody who habitually saved money, they went to your bank account and found the bank had lent out part of your deposit account, you'd be furious, wouldn't you? Demand deposits cannot be lent out by the banking sector. The reserves might be able to, and that's something I cover in another video. They're not, by the way, unless all loans are in cash. But here what happens when you say that the bank does the lending 
rather than savers. What happens is the debt turns up as an asset of the banking sector and the operation of lending occurs on both the asset side and the liability side of the bank's ledger. So when the banks lend money, credit dollars per year, the debt, which is the asset of the banking sector, rises, and the liabilities, which is the amount of money in bank accounts, rises by the identical amount. Now, what happens in this model when I change the level of sending? And what I look at, what, does anything happen to GDP? Because this is the essential argument that uh, Ed is making in that video, that there's, we've got to redirect money from the government towards the private sector to enable more GDP growth. Well, do we get GDP growth in this model? You, you know, in the previous one, we've got no GDP growth. Let's run the model. And at the moment, it's flatlining. There's no lending going on. Let's add a bit of credit to the mix. Oh my God, we've got a rising GDP. What about if credit goes down? Still positive at this stage. But I go to negative credit, GDP falls. Okay. Go back to zero again. It flatlines once more. That is a completely different vision of how the manufacturing process of money and debt actually operates. So what I'm going to show you now is more complicated still. These are a set of models where I have included the fact that government borrows. So this, this is the model that the Office of Budget Responsibility is obviously using for its vision of what the uh, Treasury does in the economy. So if I simulate this model, then you can see that even a 1% of GDP deficit, which is about, at the moment, the government deficit in the UK is running at about 5 or 6% of GDP, that leads to an exponential increase in the government's debt to GDP ratio. And it also leads, of course, to interest rates blowing out as well. So after about 30 years, I've got a debt level, having started from zero, I've got a government debt level of more than 100% of GDP. Go 40 years, we're hitting 160. Interest payments are hitting 10% of GDP. After 50 years, all this sort of stuff you saw in the OBR projection, that's the sort of effect that they get in their model. And it is completely wrong according, of course, to the Bank of England, which is another government office, just like the Office of Budget Responsibility, saying that model's false. So here we get the 700% level of, uh, that Ed was showing in that video. And that's the terrifying future that is causing all the panics that have spread through the finance market and journalists and so on. But that's not the real world. That is a mythical model taught by textbooks where banks do not originate money and debt. They do. So let's now take a look at that. All I've changed is that the debt is no longer shown as an asset of the savers stroke households. It's an asset of the banks. The big difference, you can see GDP rises because in this model, and this is the real world, when you create debt, you create money as well. That applies to the banking sector in particular lending to firms. It's more complicated when it comes to government, what's, what's actually creating the money. But look at what's happening to government debt as a percentage of GDP. Rather than that increase can continuing and becoming exponential over time, it starts to taper and it's going to reach a peak in this simulation, about 50% of GDP level, not 700%. Not the levels the OBR is scaring everybody's pants off about. Interest payments also taper. And this is not fitted to the empirical data. It's just showing if you've got your framework wrong, you've got your consequences wrong as well. You have to know how money is manufactured. And if you look at it properly and see what banks actually do, all those scare stories disappear. The government will not go bankrupt. The, the debt levels will not reach those ceilings. You don't have to freeze pensioners to death to, to avoid a, a debt calamity. Absolutely false logic. And Ed, you've been brilliant on how manufacturing is done. Apply the same stuff to money. See how money is actually made. And you find that scary story disappears. And you could do a brilliant job in communicating that to the rest of the world. Like many other truth seekers, I want to learn 50 years of real economics from me in only seven weeks. You'll love my new seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to stevecan.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like-minded people. So again, like many others, go to stevecan.com to apply as well for the seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.